Okay, thank you all for coming. Uh, propositions as types, proofs as programs, or the Curry-Howard isomorphism for Haskell beginners. So note that the title says for Haskell beginners, and, and I really do mean that. I'm gonna be focusing on trying to build the basic intuitions, not on technical precision. Um, and I'm going to assume you know some basic Haskell, but really no more than that. And for the most part, I'm gonna be limiting consideration to standard Haskell 2010, and not even all of that, just the sound subset of the type system. And there's all kinds of things you can do with GHC extensions that I will mostly not be talking about. And also, there's a lot of slides here. Um, so I'm gonna ask that, if you have like quick questions that you think I can answer in like 10 seconds or something, that's fine. Just go ahead, raise your hand, ask a question. But if it's anything more than that, anything that leads to more conversation, I'm gonna ask that you hold that to the end. I will try to end quickly enough um, for questions at the end, but I do have a lot of slides and I'm kind of uh, you know, concerned about getting through them all. There we go, so who am I? I'm a machine learning engineer at a tech company in the San Francisco Bay Area, mostly working on Python, even though I'd love to be using Haskell. And before that, I worked at a distributed database company called uh, FoundationDB, which has recently been open sourced. So this whole topic of the Curry-Howard isomorphism is a really interesting and big topic. Phil Wadler wrote a great survey paper called Propositions as Types, where he goes into the historical background of this idea going all the way back to the 1930s. And this history is really fascinating, but I will not be covering it. <laughs> so I encourage you to take a look at Wadler's paper if you wanna dig further into this. Okay, the Curry-Howard isomorphism is an isomorphism. Well, what's that? It's a morphism that has an inverse. And it's so it's necessarily between two structures. And the structures here are logical propositions and types, and also, correspondingly, constructive proofs and functional programs. Now, by logic here in this context, we mean intuitionistic logic, and that actually makes a little bit of, di of a difference, and I'll be talking about how that comes up in a couple places. Okay, so a very simple intuition for Hasklers to get you started with this. Haskell's type checker acts as a simple proof checker. So this suggests right off the bat a simple two-step procedure for proving a proposition. First, translate it into a type signature. And second, try to create an inhabitant of that type, which will usually be a function and see if it type checks. If it does, you've proved the proposition. It's that simple. And so the rest of the whole talk is sort of unpacking that. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about. We'll talk about some caveats having to do with unsoundness. We'll dive into the isomorphism itself, propositions as types, proofs as programs. We'll extend it a little bit with constructive negation. We'll do some type quando, which is some practicing with Haskell types to build up the intuition for how this works. And then we'll even go a little step further and see how we can recover classical logic using this within Haskell. What we will not talk about, I'm not gonna be getting into formal uh, systems of type theory like system F or anything like that, maybe next year. Okay, so caveats. First caveat. The propositions represented by Haskell types may strike you as trivial. And this is true, <laughs> okay? The, the Haskell type system, as type systems go, is fairly simple and basic. And sometimes this, this confuses people because they think they must be missing something. Um, don't let the simplicity of the propositions bother you. We can represent richer propositions by going to a richer type system, like dependent type, something like that. And you know, so this, this whole isomorphism does have legs and can be used and extended in various ways, but we're not really gonna be doing that with the basic Haskell type system. Next caveat, we're only gonna be considering the sound subset 
of Haskell. In other words, we're going to exclude unsound things from our consideration, like the bottom type, um, or, or inhabitants of the bottom type anyway. Um, Non-termination, general recursion. So here's an example of what I mean by some unsound things. You can do all this in Haskell, and it will, it will type check. So you can create an, something called undefined inhabitant and define it with undefined, and that will type check. You can create a recursive function, null function equals null function. That will type check. And you can do the same. You can have a function from A to B. Another way to define that other than just by immediately recursing would be to all throw away the first argument and use undefined. That would work as well. But these are all examples of unsound things. Now, Haskell itself actually gives you some unsound things. So there's like un unsafe course, which has type A to B. There's error, uh, string to something. And these, of course, have pragmatic uses. There's reasons why these things are in the language. So this is not like a, a mistake, but um, nonetheless, from a pure type theory perspective, they are unsound. And there's actually some fun, interesting things that are unsound, like fix. So you can define fix, um, which corresponds to the Y combinator in the untyped lambda calculus that encodes recursion. From a Curry-Howard isomorphism perspective, this corresponds to Curry's paradox in logic. Now, fix lets you factor out recursion in definitions, which certainly has its uses. But again, from a, a typed, type theory perspective, this is unsound. OK, so for the rest of the talk, I'm only going to be considering the sound subset of Haskell. All right, so propositions as types. This is sort of the core of the analogy, or, or the isomorphism right here. Um, a type variable will correspond to a propositional variable. A function type from A to B corresponds to an implication. A implies B. A product type corresponds to a logical conjunction, and we'll often use a tuple for that. A sum type corresponds to a disjunction in or, and we'll often use either for that. Uh, a unit type will correspond to a logical true, and a bottom type to false. So there you have the, the correspondence kind of in a nutshell. And we're going to walk through each of these things. OK, so. Algebraic data types as logical connectives. So more generally, algebraic data types in Haskell are sums of products and so correspond to disjunctions of conjunctions. So let's look at some particular examples. So we can have a simple product type, data and AB equals and AB. Now, of course, the name of the data type is arbitrary. I've called this one and to be suggestive of the Curry-Howard correspondence. Um, but we could call it foo, and it would make no difference. Usually we name types for whatever we're going to use them for in our programs. Um, often we will use a tuple in place of this for a product. Tuples are just built-in anonymous product types, so it's, it's exactly equivalent. Disjunction, so a sum type, data or a, B equals left or A or right or B. So there's no built-in anonymous sum, but by convention, we often will call this either. So either is just the simplest you know, sum type used in this way that corresponds to disjunction. True. So we have a unit type. Data unit equals unit. So unit is a type with a single nullary constructor and therefore exactly one inhabitant. That's what we mean by a unit type. Now the built-in version of this is written open close parenthesis, pronounced unit usually. It's written as if it were a zero tuple. Okay, that's kind of a pun. <laughs> 
So false corresponds to a bottom type. Bottom is a type with no constructors and therefore no inhabitants. Haskell has a void type sometimes used for this purpose. OK, wait, 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 wait what's going on here? <laughs> so, so often at this point, people are sort of like, OK, these are all very simple correspondences, but I'm kind of missing the beam here on what's the point. What is the proposition corresponding to a given type? So the answer is, in its generality is very simple. The proposition is this type is inhabited. Okay, so if you think of types as, you know, kind of use a set theoretic intuition as being like a set, it would be this set is not empty. This set has some element as its member. So in other words, what this means is a type is inhabited if and only if the corresponding proposition is true. OK? So inhabitation. Let's take the simplest possible case, a concrete type, something like int. OK, so here the, the, the type signature corresponds to the proposition, the type int is inhabited. And this definition beneath corresponds to the proof why yes it is for example by seven <laughs> so that you could view that as a proof by construction I've actually supplied you with the inhabitant that shows you that this type has some inhabitant it actually has many inhabitants so this one often throws people new to Haskell so the one thing you want to keep in mind is that t Haskell types are universally quantified. Usually that's implicit. You can turn on explicit quantification with a language extension, but in most contexts we don't. So this really means for all types A. So, so the proposition corresponding to this is every type A is inhabited. But that's not true. <laughs> We've already seen that there's a bottom type. So it's not true that every type is inhabited. So this type is uninhabited. You can't construct an inhabitant of an arbitrary type. Okay. And, and if you think of the universal quantification being there, that actually makes more sense. If you lose track of that, then this may seem confusing. So for functions, for a function type A to B, the proposition is, if A is inhabited, then so is B. Or from a more constructive per, uh, perspective, given some value X of type A, we can construct a value Y of type B. So here's an example, return list basically says, the proposition is, if you give me an, some x of type A, I can give you a value of type list of A. And indeed, the proof is easy to supply. You just take the value and wrap it in the list, and indeed, you've done exactly what the proposition claimed you should be able to do. So proofs as programs. Any value inhabiting a given type is a proof of the corresponding proposition. And when I say any value here, the value will usually be a function. Okay? So there's a nice little correspondence here. Um, the, the computational interpretation of proofs can motivate the rules of natural deduction. In natural deduction, if you've seen proof systems in a natural deduction style, there are introduction rules and elimination rules, which people sometimes find a bit unintuitive. 
but they correspond exactly to constructors and pattern matching in function definitions. So constructors correspond to introduction rules in logic, and pattern matching in Haskell corresponds to elimination rules. So we can prove any theorem with a function. We should be able to prove any, more, more specifically, we should be able to prove any theorem of propositional intuitionistic logic with a function. So let's see some examples. So modus ponens. We can read this as A implies B and A implies B. I'm verbally uncurrying a bit here. Um, if you'll permit me, but that makes it a bit clearer what the intended meaning is. All right, so how would we prove that? Well, it turns out that modus ponens is just function application. So the type signature, A implies B and A implies B, corresponds exactly to... Um, applying the function. Hypothetical syllogism. Okay, that's another theorem. If B implies C and A implies B, then A implies C. Okay? So the hypothetical syllogism is proven by the compose function. This is exactly the compose function in Haskell. So in Haskell, this is usually written dot, and that function is, that dot function is doing exactly this and corresponds to a logical theorem. Ex falso quod libet is the traditional name of this theorem, from false anything. Okay. So for this one, I'm going to cheat a little. I said I wouldn't be doing much with um, language extensions, but I'm going to use empty case here. So we can have an absurd function. This function is sound because bottom is uninhabited. So the function can never, in that sense, be called by any inhabitant of bottom. So note that the case statement here is exhaustive. It handles all the constructors of bottom, all zero of them. So absurd is a total function, trivially. Negation. Sure. You did. You did until some. I, I don't know if it's been. Included in one of the later versions of GHC, you did at some, you did until fairly recently, if, if not still true. I don't know. Negation. Um, some theorems we might want to prove involve negation. A lot of a lot of traditional theorems have a negation in it. Now, intuitionistic logic does not have classical negation, but it does have a weaker negation defined using bottom. So the definition relies on a reductio ad absurdum. If A has an inhabitant, then we could construct an inhabitant of bottom. But bottom has no inhabitants, so A must not have one either. All right? So if you want to understand intuitively why that's a reasonable definition of not, that not must be false, that's why. It's, it's a reductio ad absurdum. If A had an inhabitant, we would have to be able to construct an inhabitant of bottom. Bottom doesn't have an inhabitant, therefore A must not either. Okay, contrapositive. So A implies B impli implies not B implies not A. So although constructive negation is weaker than classical negation, it still gives us some basic theorems such as contrapositive. And we can prove that. Um, fairly straightforwardly, the not y has type b to bottom. Our f there is just a function from a to b. And so not y compose f will have function a to bottom 
which equals not A. De Morgan's laws. So the proposition here is the conjunction of negations implies the negation of the disjunction. And indeed, that's fairly straightforward to work out. If you stare at that a bit, you'll be able to convince yourself that does indeed type check. There's a flip side. There's a second version of de Morgan's law the other way around. The disjunction of negations implies the negation of the conjunction. So either not A or not B implies not A and B. And indeed, that one is also fairly easy to work out. If you stare a bit, you'll be able to mentally type check that. If not immediately, then soon enough. This is an introduction rule for double negation. If we have a true proposition, then not not that must be true. And indeed, fairly easy to construct. In this case, I've, I've, I've put um, that not x on the right-hand side with the lambda to make it match the type signature a little bit more, make things a little bit more obvious. And that works out as well. OK, eliminating double negation. If I have not not A, can I get an A? Nope. It turns out intuitionistic logic does not have an elimination rule for double negation. It's classically true, but not intuitionistically. So a function of this type would have to produce an inhabitant for A. But nothing about not not A guarantees that A is inhabited. And if it is not, we will not be able to produce the required inhabitant. So you will not be able to write a, a function definition that matches that. Excluded middle. What about this one? Either A or not A. Nope. So if, if you know a bit of intuitionistic logic, this is no surprise. This is like one of the famous features of intuitionistic logic, that it does not have excluded middle. Um, we cannot construct a left x of type A because that would require constructing an x of type A. And we don't know that A is inhabited. Um, and likewise, we can't construct a right not x of type not a, which would require constructing bottom. So that's if, if you actually try to figure out how to write a function of this type in Haskell, that, that's the problem you're going to run into, and you won't be able to. OK, so that's some theorems. Now let's some do some exercises here. So type quando, given a type, can you construct an inhabitant for it? If so, let's see one. And, and the idea here is to be, kind of leverage these um, propositions as types intuitions to begin building intuitions that help us with type-driven development. It actually helps you write code to be, be able to think this way. So this one's review. We've already seen this. That one, you know, the, the proposition here is every type is inhabited, but it isn't. For example, bottom isn't. So this one's also review. We're not going to be able to write an arbitrary function from some type A to type B. So we, we can't construct an arbitrary, in, an inhabitant of B from nothing. And giving us an inhabitant of an unrelated type A doesn't help, <laughs> right? So that, that's why. This is not going to be doable. OK, bool to integer. If bool is inhabited, then so is integer. Can we do that? Yeah, that, that's pretty simple. 
you could just marshal, you know, true to one and false to zero, or really any, any two integers you picked would do. All right. Given an inhabitant of A, I can give it back. <laughs> can we do that? Sure. Sure. This is the polymorphic identity function included in Prelude. All right. A to B to A. Given an inhabitant of A, I can give it back even after being given something else. Yep, const. And basically, it, you could think of this as, an, as like an identity, except you ignore the second argument. All right. A and B implies B and A. Sure. I called this one and commutes um, to make it sound logical. <laughs> but in data.tuple, this is called swap. <laughs> so. <laughs> OK. A and B implies A or B. Sure. So there are two inhabitants corresponding to whether you use the left or right element of the tuple. And they are, they're sort of symmetric. OK. A and B implies A. Indeed, this is called first in data.tuple. So. A implies A and B. Nope. You can't construct the required inhabitant of B. If A implies B implies C, then B implies A implies C. Yes, indeed. This is flip included in Prelude. We take the function on the left and return an equivalent function that takes its arguments in reverse order. And that will. Okay, just, so basically, I should always read it as for all A, for all B, for all C. Always. There's always, uh, that is implicit. You can actually turn that on. You can uh, and turn on um, explicit quantification, and you, you'll actually add those for alls explicitly. But it al it's always implicit otherwise. OK, maybe A. So let me give you a hint. Recall the definition of maybe, if you haven't looked at it in a while. Maybe is a sum type of nothing or just A, where nothing is a nullary constructor. So in this sense, it's like the unit constructor. So if you think about maybe A from a Curry-Howard perspective, the proposition it corresponds to is true or A, just as if we had written either unit A. OK? So yes, maybe A is inhabited because maybe has a constructor, nothing, that doesn't depend on A. Which is actually the whole point of maybe, <laughs> to take a type that may or may not be inhabited and wrap it in a type that always will be. OK, that's what makes maybe useful. So it, it turns out that the, the, prag the pragmatic thing maybe is used for in programming exactly makes sense in terms of its Curry-Howard interpretation. OK, A implies. A or B? Yeah. Because we can simply wrap whatever inhabitant of A we're given with the left constructor for either. And then we have satisfied the, um, the type. 
A or B implies A. Nope, because if you're given a right value for B, you can't construct an inhabitant of A. So, A or A implies A. Yeah, that one's easy. That's just whether it's left or right, you unwrap it the same way. Okay. If A and B imply C, then A implies B implies C. In other words, we can convert this conjunction on the left to an implication. It's currying. It's currying. You're close. That's exactly what currying does. All right, so this is a fun example. A implies A implies A implies A. <laughs> and I don't have a nice logical like name for this or something. This is inhabited. It has infinitely many inhabitants. However, any inhabitant of this must follow a similar pattern. Namely, it must take that second argument, which is a function in the middle, and apply it to the first argument zero or more times. And we can actually discover the number of times, discover the number of iterations by probing with zero and successor. Okay, so for any given inhabitant of F, someone just tells you this is an arbitrary inhabitant of that type signature. You don't know, you don't really know much about it. You can feed it zero and success, successor, Ma you know, make sure the, the, the um, A is int, and it'll give you some number, like two, maybe one, maybe three, you know, you don't know, but it's going to give you something. And if it gives you like two, then you know the inhabitant had to be something like that. It had to apply it twice, because that's how you get two is the successor of the successor of zero. So even though you don't know what the inhabitant is, you can kind of probe it and, and get some information about it. So that, that's kind of fun. Okay, classical logic. So I said this is all based on intuitionistic logic, and it's weaker than classical logic. But we can actually recover classical logic somewhat awkwardly <laughs> by adding in axioms. So we'll use, we'll use some types to express additional axioms. And for this, we'll need some, some language extensions. So I said I wasn't going to do much with language extensions. Well, I, I need them for this to make, to make this work. So we can, we can add in proof by contradiction. We could add in eliminate double negation, which I showed you before was not part of intuitionistic logic. Or we could add in excluded middle. Actually, we could add any of these, any, th any one of them, and that will bump us up in, in strength to classical logic. And um, they're interprovable. You could, you could take any of those three and prove any of the others from them. Some of the proofs are easy, some are not. So I'll, I'll show you a couple of them here. Um, from proof by contradiction, it's easy to prove double negation. So that's actually just a one-liner um, there that works. From double negation, well, from, uh, from eliminating double negation, we can prove exclu exclu exclusive middle, a little bit more complicated. Got a bunch of lambdas there. Uh, 
The others are more difficult. So going from like excluded middle to proof by contradiction, you, you can do those too, but I'm going to kind of leave that as an exercise. The, the proofs get a little bit more hairy and you kind of wouldn't be able to follow them on a slide anyway. So, but this is kind of fun. All right. So this is just taking the very basic Haskell type system and the kind of propositional intuitionic, intuitionistic logic that it corresponds to. Richer type systems correspond to richer logics. Uh, dependent types are a, a good example of that. So we could look at something like Koch or Agda or Idris. Or even you can do this in Haskell if you add in um, the appropriate GHC language extensions. And this is where the Curry-Howard isomorphism kind of gets really interesting and, and, and useful. So for example, in Koch, using very similar techniques. Um, people have done things like um, certifying a C compiler, um, proving properties of various rich data structures. The four color theorem was actually verified in Coke. So working with proof assistants can be a bit more challenging, but they're, they're becoming more accessible as that technology matures and, and practical applications are appearing more and more. So one last um, paper I want to point you to. How many of you guys went to Michael Stay's keynote yesterday? Okay, that was pretty awesome, I thought, on the row calculus and behavioral types. Well, he, a um, few years ago, wrote a paper with John Baez called Physics, Topology, Logic, and Computation, a Rosetta Stone. And he basically takes, what that's all about is taking the Curry-Howard isomorphism and sort of extending it into various areas of physics and mathematics. And it is very, very cool, especially if you're at all into physics as well as, as this functional programming stuff and kind of thinking about physics almost from a functional programming perspective. And it, it kind of blows your mind. So it's very cool. All right. Well, thank you very much. Any questions you want to? Can you go back to the previous thing? Sure. Anything else? Well, if not, I want to thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoy the conference. <laughs>